If anyone thirsts, let him come to me, and I will give him rivers of living water. That's actually what I'm going to talk about. This is a, called an illustration. Anyway, all right. So, uh, continuing from last night. <clears throat> now, I know a lot of you were not here last night, some of you. So, the most common question people ask me is, I've been praying for this person to be healed, delivered, saved, and it hasn't happened. What am I missing? So, over my, the last few years, through my experiences and experiences of Steve and all my circle of friends, I've kind of made a list of things. You can see it two ways. One of which is, if you'd like to see people set free, healed, delivered, saved, do these things. And you'll have, probably have pretty good results. If you don't do these things, that's why they're not healed. So you can take it as a negative or a positive. <laughs> if you're looking for a list of things you haven't done, here's the list. Um, this is not a list God gave me. It's not divine revelation, really. It's my own observations of things that I have noticed that work. Some of them are things I don't even do. I just know they work because other people are doing them and they work. So I don't have full revelation and detail on all of this stuff, but people here do have revelation on it. So if you want to go to them and find out more about that, I can kind of... Um, last night, we talked about hindrances to healing, or you could see them as keys to healing, one of which is understanding the true nature of God. If you do not have a a reasonably decent understanding of the true nature of God, how much he loves us, how much he wants us healed, that will prevent you from getting other people healed and it also can prevent you from receiving healing. Okay? Second issue people struggle with is an understanding of their own identity. Because we all assume and take on are given identities throughout our life. I have a lot of friends who identify themselves as paramedics, cops, soldiers. What you do for a living can become your identity, but it is not your identity. It is what you do for a living. I know a lot of people who have taken on diabetes as their identity. I am a diabetic. Uh, my MS is ruining my life. It's my MS. You sort of become, you take on the identity of your disease. Uh, my disability. Okay. Those things are never your identity. It is a temporary condition that God wants to heal you of. Your identity is a beloved son who is destined to walk in the fullness of God. That is who you always were. That is who you always will be. You just need to get your mind renewed and break down some of those false identities that people have given you over your life. So identity is another issue. Um, once you start to know and accept and embrace your true identity as a son, it becomes a lot easier to exercise authority and release power. Okay, identity doesn't get people healed, but it does show you what the tools are and how to use them. All right, so continuing, Steve and I were having a little conversation outside. And Steve has been working on some very interesting uh, problems over the last few years. 
He's been ministering to people who have severe um, emotional trauma, which is, can be very difficult to heal. And Steve said, it's really all about the information. It's getting access to the information that you need. And what he means is, if a person is bound up because of witchcraft curses or Freemasonry or ritual abuse or whatever, you have to know those things. If you don't know what what you're going up against, you can try to exercise authority and release power all day long and nothing's gonna change. Some things have to be broken. Agreements, curses, they have to be got rid of. And sometimes you have to know specific information, specific details. And if you don't have that revelation, <clears throat> you're not going to get breakthrough. It's just not going to happen. first started to engage God this way and I would just be hugged by the Father or Jesus the Holy Spirit it totally exploded my theology and God spoke to me one day and he said how much of what you know about me and how much do you what do you know about the Christian life has come by direct revelation from me in personal experience or how much has come through what someone else has told you. And I want you to think about that question because that question and the answer to that question will determine whether you know God in reality or whether you know about him. Because if what you've believed about the Bible, the word of God, has come through someone else's teaching, someone else's revelation, what you were brought up with as a child, that is not knowing God. That's only knowing about him because the biblical word for knowing means intimacy. It means like knowing a husband and wife, knowing each other in intimacy. It's that level of experience that we can only say we know God if we had. Now that experience is available for all of us, but we have to pursue it. And when we pursue it, we'll find that the truth that's revealed in that relationship will actually explode some of the thinking that we have about God. When I encountered God face to face and in experience of heart to heart, it exploded the myth of who I thought God was. And I would have argued with anybody that God was like this, was like this, was like this, because that was how I was taught. And even some of my experiences of God were framed by that thinking. So they were interpreted by the framework of my mind. And I want to encourage you to allow the relationship with God to completely renew your mind so that you know the truth and you don't just know about it. It's really, really important as we go forward uh, that we really do know God. Because if we don't know him, we can't know ourselves. If we don't know ourselves, then what are we going to demonstrate to the world? Religion, effectively. You know, I've had enough of religion you know, religion basically ruined my life. Now God is restoring the truth and bringing me into a deeper relationship with him. Ephesians three sixteen to 18 says this, I desire for you to become intimately acquainted with the love of Christ on the deepest possible level. That is what God's desire is for every one of us. That we would come to know him by experience on the deepest possible level. Now, think of what that might be. And then it will go beyond, beyond, beyond whatever you can imagine or think. Far beyond the reach of mere academic intellectual grasp. So that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I mean, can you imagine being filled with the fullness of God? What would that be like? It will totally transform and revolutionize our lives when we're filled with the fullness of God. Awaken to the consciousness of his closeness. He's with us all the time. Promises never to leave us, never forsake us. We actually live and exist in him. 
Without him, we couldn't exist. Separation is an illusion. So whenever you feel separated from God, usually because of we've done something that causes us to think that God has withdrawn from us, it is a lie. God is never, ever separated from us. When Adam was hiding in the bushes, trying to cover up, doing the do-it-yourself version of religion, very first attempt, what was God saying to him? Adam, what have you done? I'm angry with you. No, what he said is, where are you, Adam? Because God wanted relationship. And if Adam had run to God in relationship, he would have been completely restored. But he went and followed the DIY path. And we have been doing it ever since. So I encourage you, separation is a total illusion that we have been deceived into believing that God separates himself from us, and he never does. Oneness was God's idea all along. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says this, the dynamic of our strategy is revealed in God's ability to disengage mindsets and perceptions. That's what he's going to be doing over these days, here, and the rest of your life disengaging the false mindsets that you have and the false perceptions that you have that have held people captive in pseudo-fortresses for centuries. Every lofty idea and argument positioned against the knowledge of God is cast down and exposed to be a mere invention of our own imagination. Uh, one of the things that caused me to really take writing serious is I had a uh, I had an encounter uh, in heaven where I found myself standing before uh, three of these scribes and they were holding staffs in their hand and uh, and then I just heard the voice of the Lord and He was connecting me with uh, this understanding of of operating on earth and in heaven. And so like when I'm standing here, uh, and, and I'm sure you've heard this, you know, these terms before, but uh, being multidimensional, that's something that's been out there for a while more and more. So I actually see myself not just standing here, but when I'm moving, I can move in other realms in the kingdom of heaven simultaneously. So I'm like visually moving back and forth or engaging or whatever. And I always used to do that, but I didn't recognize. I just thought it was just kind of like that's just part of it, you know. And so uh, I learned more and more how to operate as a multidimensional being. I know that sounds like something out of space. But uh, uh, it really helped me to understand how to, you know, that's, about as, that's probably about as close to multitasking that I get. Uh, <laughs> You know, because on the other hand, I can be very distracted. I'd be trying to do something, and I just got to, you know, I can be very distracted the other way. And uh, so, anyhow, it's interesting. So, stand before these three scribes, and a lot of my gateways come out of music. I'm very spontaneous, have been doing it since the year, since the year 2000. Uh, I, it wasn't anything anybody taught me. It was just this impulse that was inside of me wanting to engage in worship and I'd just make it up as I went. And so as a, uh, as a result, uh, I was able to connect with many musicians all over the world and many different people in different ways. And I'm always the one, like, they can outplay me, right? Uh, but I just, I just had that connect where I could just connect in the spirit and just go there. And uh, so that's how a lot of prophetic things, when I would speak to them about the future, uh, I would just see them unfold. And, uh, and everything that I'm telling you is, I believe, it's accessible to anybody and everybody. Uh, as you have heard and probably will hear more, it, you know, whatever you practice the most, whatever you give your attention to the most, that's what you develop. And um, so, you know, there's things that I, I, I lean toward more than other things, but I'm trying to develop it all. And, but I kind of just stay in this framework. And I haven't forgot the scribes. I'm getting there. Uh, this, this is what happens, right? Uh, so over the course of time, I've been in front of senators. I've been in front of uh, Supreme Court justice. I've, I've, you know, been exposed to different things in, in, uh, 
and the political ring. I never really waved the flag about it. I was a little bit cautious and, uh, and still am to some degree because I know how people are really trying to build ministries and it's like, oh, this is my opportunity to do this. So, uh, but it, it was just some inroads that the Lord gave me insight concerning things that were going on. Uh, concerning, you know, wherever you stand with the current president, Donald Trump. Uh, back in 2007, the Lord gave me insight uh, as to a president who would be a financier, and, uh, and I spoke prophetic words that he would not, it, it, that we were coming into an era where you would know the pre highest office of, of the United States and eventually other nations of the world would not be bought or sold. And, uh, and so we, we saw many of those things happen, and, uh, and, you know, he said, I'm going to blow, you know, blow the trumpet in the White House. But I didn't, you know, I didn't connect it to actually Donald Trump. I just had all these bits and pieces. Uh, another person that I felt was very accurate, uh, uh, and even previous that, was Kim Clement. It was around 2004, 2005. Uh, Kim, I connected with him in the early 90s. And so uh, he really inspired me in this sense about the future, that seeing the future from a glorious perspective. During that time, I had some friends that were leaning into that, but a lot of people weren't really looking at the future in, in a very good light. And so uh, just the sound of worship and many other things uh, really just impacted me in a powerful way and just really brought me into the revelation of just, you know, kingdom interaction and stuff and the intent and desire of God for his people. So um, I love looking into the future. I love the things that God is releasing and folding in the earth. So I'm standing before these scribes and, um, and I hear these words uh, in heaven, one of the things that you will be doing is a, you'll be a scribe. And I have to be honest, I was a little bit disappointed. <laughs> I mean, I kind of was like, you know, my first thought, you know, and of course it, it was out loud, like, what can I write about that everybody doesn't already know about, you know? Like, I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the, the room of, you know, amazing writers and, you know, all this, and like, what can I do? But all of a sudden I heard this intense sound of the Lord, and he says, my kingdom is, a, is an expanding kingdom, and to it there is no end. And I was like, oh, wow. And in that moment, I, there was an impartation that took place. And you know how you've, you've heard someone say, you know, like God gave you a corner of the earth or gave you a piece. I feel like I got a corner of heaven. You know, like this measure, it just impacted me. And I had this intense craving to even write more and just kind of follow, you know, that path that God had for me.